Good morning. Good to see you. Um, I just want to say a big thank you, John Richardson, for, uh, for making this cross for us this morning, just to help with our service this morning. Um, when I chat to people, sorry, when I chat to people, sometimes they say um, things like, uh, why would Jesus die for me? You know, why would, he, why would he do that for me? Why would he go to the cross for me? Or they might say, um, do you know, I'd hate Jesus to have gone to the cross for just my mistakes. And uh, you, can't, you can't be all in for Jesus unless you get a revelation. You can't be all in for Jesus and let you, with a secondary revelation. You know, I can tell you all I want about the cross, about Jesus. But if you don't get that revelation for yourself... You can't be all in for Jesus. You need to get your own truth. You need to get your own revelation. And if you want a title this morning, the title is Get Your Own Revelation. So what's revelation? Revelation is that moment, that, that, that unfolding time where you start to discover who God is for yourself. Discover where God reveals himself and all that he is and all that, he, all that you need to know about him and all that your plans and purpose are for his, his plans and purposes for your life. That's revelation. The unfolding of his character and who he is. It's a supernatural thing. It's, just, it's not something you can just kind of, it's not head knowledge, it's heart knowledge. And one of the prime ways we can do it is through reading the Bible. So we're not going to do a a three-point sermon today. Sorry. We're not going to do a three-point sermon today. We're going to do something a bit different today. And I'm going to actually just read this morning the whole one of the one of the accounts from Luke 23 of of the crucifixion. And we're just going to read quite a big chunk of the Bible this this morning and just let the Bible speak for itself. Because as I was preparing this this week. I just had this realization. I have, has the cross become a, become a bit too familiar to me? Has it, has it, have, I, have I kind of made a comfortable cross? I, I need a new revelation. So I'm going to read from Luke 23 in a minute. And whether you follow in your Bible, whether you close your eyes, or whether you just listen, or whether you follow on the screen. I just want, we're just going to pray just for a moment or two now. And I want each of us just in our places just to ask God for a fresh revelation as we just literally read the word of God together. So just in your hearts, wherever you're sat now, just say, you know, just echo this prayer. You know, Jesus, will you come? Holy Spirit, will you come and will you bring fresh revelation of, the, of your word, will you give us fresh revelation of the cross today? Holy Spirit, will you help us to see familiar texts with new eyes? Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. So this is Luke 23, verse 26 to 43, and I'm going to read it quite slowly. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and they put the cross on him, and they made him carry it behind Jesus. And a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. And Jesus turned and he said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. For a time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, 
what will happen when it's dry. Two other men, both criminals, were led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one to his right and the other to his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching. The rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. And the soldiers also came up and they mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was a written notice above him which read, the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since we are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. It was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And as the sun stopped shining, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called with a loud voice, Father, Into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. And the centurion, seeing what happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. powerful it's powerful isn't it just to read that we're just going to look at a few people a few groups of people that were at the cross that day so we're going to start with the bystander so the bystander was Simon it says in verse 26 that they seized Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and they placed a cross on his back and made him carry it behind Jesus so what do we know about Simon so Simon was from Cyrene, which would now be uh, Tripoli in Libya, in North Africa. And we know from Acts 2 that the, uh, there was Jews living in, in, in Cyrene because uh, in Acts 2, when Pentecost happened, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, it says there were some Jews from Cyrene there. And Simon, he's simply passing through the country. I don't think he intended to be there at the time. He hadn't come to see the crucifixion. He was passing through the country. Maybe it was on business. Maybe he was uh, going from one place to another. Maybe he was a pilgrim. But he was there uh, passing through the country. And as he's, as he's there, he's, he's making his way through the crowds. And then he, he sees Jesus. And he sees the cross. And because he's a... Uh, because he's uh, 
he's under the law, they're under the law of the Romans in, in that area. He, he's got to do as he's told. And so the Romans say, hey, you will, you, will you carry that cross? And he's got no choice, but he's got to carry the cross. I mean, he's, or who is he? He's just, the, he's just the father of Alexander and Rufus. He didn't volunteer to do this. He's, he's forced upon him. Some accounts say he was seized and it was placed on his back. You know, maybe for some of us, you know, our faith is a second-hand faith. It's the faith of our, of our parents. It's the faith of our grandparents. It's the fra- faith of our friends. And we haven't got that faith for ourselves. We don't own it for ourselves. We haven't had that, that first-hand revelation. Or maybe we're a bit like Simon and we're, we're kind of rushing from place to place and there's a bit of Jesus here and a bit of Jesus there squeezed into our time, but it's not something that we're working out in our everyday life. The second group of people that were at the cross that day were the mockers. And they were from every, every group of life. They were the, the common people. They were the religious leaders. They were the, the soldiers. Even the criminals mocked Jesus. You know, the religious said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers were saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And even one of the criminals, the barefaced, the barefaced shame of it, one of the criminals said, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. Why? Because he had no revelation. They didn't understand who he was. The next group of people at the cross were the daughters of Jerusalem, the, the women who were there supporting Jesus. It says in verse 28, Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children. You know, there were some women there and they were genuinely moved by what was happening that day. They, they'd supported Jesus all through his ministry. They'd cared for his needs. But we also know at that time there were professional mourners. And what their job was to do, they would go from place to place where someone had died and they would just cry and wail and you know, that was their job. What a job that would be. You know, it was the same, it was the same mourners that were there when, when uh, Jairus' daughter was dead and Jesus had to shut them out of the room, those dissenting voices. And Jesus turned to them and said, look, I don't need your sorrow. I need your heart. I need you to be all in for me. I want you to realize you don't need, I don't need your sorrow. You need a savior. Because one day your sin and all you've done wrong is going to be judged and you need a savior. See, the other criminal who was on the cross, he got, he got it. It took him a long time. It took him all his life. He'd messed up all his life. And then he's on the cross and he's next to Jesus and suddenly he gets it. He's God. He, he's a king. He's, he's going to a kingdom. He's going to paradise. Jesus, will, will you remember me when you go into your kingdom? And Jesus turns to him and says... Truly, you're going to be with me today in paradise. See, he's had a revelation. He's had a revelation on the cross. And then finally, we get the Roman soldier. And the Roman soldier, he's, he's, he's up close and personal to the action. And the Romans would have been pagans. They would have had beliefs in mythological creatures and uh, they would have had emperors as their god. They would have put their trust in, in, in all kinds of other gods. They'd have been hard men. They'd have, they'd have been well-trained. They were, they were a well-trained, well-oiled unit. Battle-hardened. They'd have been used to seeing pain and suffering up close and personal, perhaps even numb to it, second nature to them. And it says in Luke 23, 34, that Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And other versions, other, other versions of the Bible say he was saying, Father, forgive them. 
And I wonder in that moment how many times Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. If you went up, uh, somebody who was going to be crucified, they'd have their back ripped open by whips and their back would be scoured. And then when they ripped their clothes off them, all that clotting blood would just be reopened again. Father, forgive them. The, the wounds of Jesus' back would be scraping against the bare wood. It would have been rough. Father, forgive them. As they dropped him into the ground, Father, forgive them. As they nailed his wrists and his, the, the nail went through the median nerve, which would have sent lightning bolts of pain going up and down his arms, Father, forgive them. As he was struggling to get his breath, Father, forgive them. As every joint in his body was, was dislocated, Father, forgive them. As they were mocking and insulting him, Father, forgive them. As they gambled for his last remaining belongings, his clothes, Father, forgive them. As he sees Ben and all his sin, Father, forgive him. As he sees the whole of the sin of mankind, all of the wrong things that every single person on earth had ever done, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And as the soldier watches this execution, it's no ordinary execution, something has happened. It says in Matthew 27, 54, when the centurion and those who were with him regarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. When Jesus gave up his final breath, from 12 till noon, it was dark. It was some kind of solar eclipse. If we read the accounts of Matthew and Mark, it says there were, there were earthquakes, earthquakes, the rocks were split open. There was a huge rip as the four inch, 30 foot curtain in the temple was ripped from top to bottom. Could have heard it from a mile away, I would have thought. People were even resurrected from the dead. And then uh, this centurion, he, he gets his revelation. This is the Son of God. He's God. You know, the gospel or the good news can be summed up like this. Can I just borrow you a set, Mark? So you pop your Bible. If I just take the. If you just come here, set, Mark. Bring your Bible. Okay, stand, if you could just stand with you like that, with one arm there and one arm there. Just come to the front. So you stood up like a sort of like cross shape, yeah? See, it can be summed up like this, Isaiah 53, 6. For you all are like sheep that have gone astray. You know, these are our iniquities. It says the Lord took our iniquities, our sin, all the things that we had done wrong. And he lays our iniquities on Jesus. You see, Jesus, he'd done nothing wrong. Nothing at all. There was no separation from him and God. And he took our iniquities, our sin, all the things that we'd done wrong. And what we have now is we have no separation between us and God. And that's the good news of Jesus. That is the gospel in one sentence. Thank you, Mark. And our challenge today is, when did we get our last revelation about the cross? When was the last time that we just spent some time just reading, rereading those accounts for ourselves outside of church to get our own revelation? You know, we can watch, we can come to church on a Sunday, we can watch services online. We can watch famous preachers around the world and we can end up with a, sometimes with just a second-hand revelation, it's someone else's revelation. But we, need to, but we need our own revelation. We need a first-hand revelation. You know, maybe the cross has become a bit comfortable for us, a bit familiar. 
But in the light of the cross, is it, are we daily working it out in our own lives? And I just felt this week that as I was praying and preparing, I just felt the Holy Spirit say, you need to get your own revelation. The cross should impact on every part of our lives, our, our relationships, our work, our, our family relationships, our finances, every aspect of our life. You know, some things might have to die today. I really felt this morning, Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety of the heart makes, causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. And it may be that anxiety needs to die at the cross today be laid at the cross today so as we finish I just want to go back to Simon who we started with hit the bystander and he was he was the father of Alexander and Rufus now why would Mark have said it's the father of Alexander and Rufus why would he have said that because the Alexander and Rufus would have been known to Mark and to to Mark's readers and then we get a clue in Romans 16, 13 about what happened next. And it says in, in Romans 16, 13, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother who's been a mother to me too. You know, could it be that day that when Simon saw Jesus, he didn't just see Jesus, but he met Jesus? There's a difference. Could it be that after that day that Alexander and Rufus' his sons, they became followers of Jesus? Could it be that that day, after that day, his wife became a follower of Jesus? Because on the third day there was a resurrection. And when they met Jesus, they suddenly realized he was God. They believed They suddenly realise he's the saviour, he's the Lord. They suddenly realise he's the king of kings. They suddenly realise that's not just Joseph's son and Mary's son. That's God. They suddenly realise it's not just the, the local carpenter, the local tecton. He's God. It's a moment of transformation. Because in that moment... They got their own revelation. See, Simon now isn't a bystander. His family aren't bystanders. They, they were the ones that looked after Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. They're not bystanders anymore. They're all in. They're all in because they got their own revelation. Let's pray, and then I'll hand over to Andrew. Lord, we, we need our own revelation today. Lord, we can't have a second-hand revelation. It can't be someone else's revelation. It has to be our revelation. Lord, will you bring us fresh revelation this morning? Lord, will you come? And start right now, Lord, ministering to people, wherever they are, to give, give us that fresh revelation of who you are. We want to be all in for you, Jesus. We want to be all in. We want to be all in for you today. Help us to be sold out for you, Lord. Give us that fresh revelation, Jesus of who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen.